Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Let's talk about cancer and let's talk about, when I talk about these diseases with patients, one of the things I try to do is say, let's reverse engineer what we think is happening when this disease goes wrong and then back things out. So when it comes to cancer, I say, look, cancer has a bunch of things that have to go wrong. First, you have to have a genetic insult. Two, it has to be missed by the immune system. And fortunately, most of the time, our T cells can figure out that cancer is non-self, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of walk through all of these things. So let's talk about the immune system for a moment, because we know that if you're not, well, I want to let you explain that. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let you go from there, because <laughs> I, I was going to, I was just about to go off on this topic, but tell me about how sleep impacts the immune system and not only how that might impact getting common colds, but how it could impact cancer. So firstly, what we know is that there are now significant links epidemiologically between sleep and cancer of a variety of forms. Currently, that list includes cancer of the bowel, cancer of the prostate, and cancer of the breast. And then we can step down. Which are basically three of the top four. Uh, exactly. Yeah, three of the heavy hitters. Next, you can sort of say, okay, what, what about the causal evidence? Well, firstly, I would say before I describe the causal evidence, that causal evidence is now so strong that recently the World Health Organization decided to classify any form of nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. Their words, not mine. And the proof of evidence that is required by the World Health Organization to make such a statement usually has to be astronomical. And that data is now, I think, very well put in place. I'll just mention one quick causal manipulation study done by a colleague down at UCLA. They took a group of healthy adults and they limited them to just four hours of sleep for one single night. And then they looked at a set of cells called natural killer cells. And you can think of natural killer cells like the secret service agents of the immune system in that they're pretty good at identifying dangerous foreign elements, one of which are malignant cancerous cells. Um, they'll inject some things into them and try and destroy them, essentially. So what you want is a pretty virile set of those immune assassins circulating in your body. And what they found is that one night of four hours of sleep reduction led to a 70% drop in natural killer cell activity. That's quite a surprising state of immune deficiency that has happened within one night. So you can step and repeat that and imagine what would be the state of your immune system, particularly for those critical anti-cancer fighting immune cells after several weeks, if not months of insufficient sleep. That's one aspect, which is what is your vulnerability to developing cancer? Because, you know, many of us are, you know, will have cancer cells emerging in our body every day. Or, so we need those aspects of our immune system to prevent those cells from becoming the disease that we call cancer. I mean, that's such an important point, And I'm probably biased because I, I trained in an immunotherapy lab, but I don't think people necessarily appreciate that we pretty much always have cancer and our immune system is pretty much always protecting us. It's actually the exception when the cancer develops into something clinically. Correct. And yeah. you know, I've debated, not debated is the wrong question. I, one of my favorite sort of sitting around dinner discussions with, with cancer biologists is what is the greater driving force for the obvious age association of cancer? In other words, why does cancer increase non-linearly as you age? And I offer two hypotheses. Is it three, actually? Is it an increase in the rate of mutagenesis? Yep. Do, you ex do you experience on a per unit of time basis a greater insult to the genome? Two, if you assume that that's the same, is it that over time the accumulation and the expression, the phenotype of that becomes more problematic? And or three, is it that our immune system, specifically the adaptive immune system, is weakening and the balance starts tipping in favor of cancer? And, you know, I've asked this question of Nobel laureates and future Nobel laureates. Every one of them has said, we don't know. They suspect it's all of the above, but they all agree that the weakening of the adaptive immune system is almost assuredly playing a role in 
why we get cancer more as we age, because we know many things are working against us when we do that. And so when I hear you say NK cells, which, you know, the CD8 cell, the NK cell, the CD4 cell, these are these are your green berets and your Navy SEALs yeah. of the war against cancer. If you put a hit on those guys, you you know, you could be taking a 10-year step in the wrong direction, Correct. just as you talked about the gonadal 10-year leap, right, yeah. with testosterone. I mean, I would love to add a 3B hypothesis there, which is that one of the most dramatic changes with age and the most sizable and robust physiological changes in with age that we see is that your sleep gets worse. And sleep is probably one of the most powerful regulators of your immune system. You know, if you want a full arsenal and you want every single weapon in there to be sharp and ready to annihilate, sleep is what you need. That data, I think, is very clear in terms of the decimation of your immune system with sleep. And that, you know, I just gave one example there too. And the funny thing is, like, you give that example and it's not even that dramatic. Like, there's no person listening to this who hasn't had a four-hour sleep night. That's part and parcel for just being a human being in the civilized world, maybe even in the non-civilized world, right? And yet to think about a lifetime of stacking those things and the compounding effect of what does it mean to get eight hours a night versus 6.225 hours a night? Imagine that. I'm almost amazed it doesn't kill us quicker. Because to your point, we have adapted a great system to cope with excess nutrients, right? We had a great system. And it takes a long time for that to, to break us down. I think in some ways, we're probably so naive in our ability to measure the short-term consequences of sleep. I mean, not you, of course, because this is what no, you're thinking about you're day right. and night. I think you're right. But I think as a medical community, we're really shitty at knowing how to measure short-term, like what's really happening in sleep Especially deprivation. Especially in, you know, in clinics and in, in healthcare systems. Yeah, like in I schools, we are... like we don't really understand how bad sleep deprivation is on a learning child. We don't, we clearly don't understand what it's doing on the road. Like we don't, we don't understand that this will kill you much faster than, you know, bad nutrition, right? Which is and clearly going to kill you. You know, if you look at all cause mortality and short sleep, it's not even linear, it's exponential. You know, it really, it, sleep will bend that curve of your lifespan in a downward direction with a dart into the ground when it starts to get short. I think your argument is so great that it really comes down to the fact that at least we had a system in place to train us for excess nutrients. Now, look, we can argue we didn't have a system to train us to consume refined carbohydrates. We didn't have a system that trained to consume massive amounts of polyunsaturated fats or high, high amounts of sucrose. But we still knew how to consume some of these things. And there is a dampening effect in nutrition that the you know ever-present adipocyte can numb and at least for a while, blunt that system. But you're right. If we didn't, if it wasn't really until, what, probably 200 years ago that sleep deprivation could have become common. I mean, when do you really think was the tipping point? I know that in the 40s, we could compare the 40s to today, but it would almost seem like the light bulb was a pretty big step in the wrong the direction. Electrified, yeah. you know, you can Not to blame Edison. For, yeah, yeah, but you could go back and you could argue that, you know, Edison with the light bulb and his, his company may have been the starting point. I think it's, it was probably happening even earlier on the basis of social demands. You know, the industrial era, I think, then really yeah, started the, yeah. to compound things. Once we switch from an agrarian society to an industrial society, in my mind, that's when stuff Which really is, started to I mean, my history is horrible, wrong. but that's about 250 years yeah, ago, Yeah, right? exactly, yeah. So I think we've been, that, that curve has started to happen. So um, it's an evolutionary millisecond. Correct, correct. Sounds like a long time, blink of an eye. The other aspect of, you know, cancer is not just that you increase your risk for developing cancer because you weaken the immune system components that are there to combat against all of those, you know, carcinogenic influences cellularly that you've just described. But another study by a colleague at the University of Chicago, David Gozal, he looks at the relationship between sleep loss and cancer in mice. And I'll just give you one example of a study he did. Took a group of mice, inoculated them with some cancer cells on their back, and then gave that cancer a one month period to grow. And at the end of the month, he resected the skin, measured the size of the tumor. Half of those mice were allowed to sleep normally. 
the other half had their sleep restricted. So they just had their sleep kind of top and tailed, not total deprivation, just limiting their sleep in the morning and the evening a little bit. What they found is that at the end of that one month, those underslept mice, when they looked at them, the tumor was 200% larger. I mean, it was physically distorting the body. And if you were to see these pictures, you know, you would just think, my goodness, you know, I can see a small, tiny little sort of dot that is the growth of the, the cancer in the well-slept mice. You know, the others, it just looked like a hideous, you know, mass on these underslept mice. Secondly, what they found was that that cancer in those underslept mice had actually metastasized, which is just, you know, in some ways a fancy way of saying that it had breached the original origin and started to invade other organs, bone, as well as brain. And when cancer becomes metastatic, you know, that's when we know things can get really dark and grim in terms of life expectancy. There are many mechanisms that you could generate or, or hypothesize it, yeah. could explain that. I, I'm curious as to how many there were. So, so one would, I think, be exactly what we've described, which is this immune weakening. Yeah. But you could also look at so hypercortisolemia is going to drive hepatic glucose output. So That's they going to create hyperinsulinemia. Did they curve? They, when you look they at those adrenalectomized things, the mice and then prior they fed to that. them prior to it. So they controlled they the controlled stress. They controlled the metabolic response. Correct, yeah. And what they did find in terms of, they looked a little bit at the mechanism. They found that macrophage M1 cells, those were actually downregulated by a lack of sleep. And what was upregulated was a sort of a rogue version, which was called the M2 cells, which seemed to have a tumor promotion component to them as well. Wow. So, so they really, but the, the adrenalectomy is brilliant. What a, what a so clever design. You have to take out the stress response and they limited that. Imagine and if you still, didn't. And that's the fear is how much worse would it be when it really happens in humans? Because you will have that plus this huge tsunami of a cortisol impact, hypercortisol impact, which is only going to make so, so, worse. So bring this now back to the clinical tragedy here, right? Which is, again, the weakness of our profession. And I say ours, meaning mine and not yours. You take a patient who's got a diagnosis of cancer. Do you think anxiety is going to go up? Hell yes, right? Do you think their sleep is going to deteriorate on no basis other than the fact that they have this diagnosis and they're often undergoing horrible treatment, right? It's amazing to me that I can't imagine how many oncologists are thinking through this problem, right? Which is as careful as we are about crafting what the chemotherapy regimen looks like, what the exact, if you go to ASCO, right? If you go to the largest oncology meeting, I don't know how many papers are being addressed on this topic. Do yeah. you? No, I, and I think there are they are few and far between with Whereas, regards if you, to sleep. If you think about some of the stuff we machinate over in oncology, like exactly who gets the sentinel node biopsy versus this, and well, what if this is an ER PR positive breast cancer versus an ER positive PR negative? Or, like we could we could noodle and and machinate on the most minute details, which you know maybe they matter, maybe they don't. And yet something like this seems so obvious, and yet, you know, we just seem ill-equipped to deal with it. 